Sherry, do you have all your tomatoes planted? Oh yes, they've. I it was a little late getting them in this year. Of course, part of that's a good thing. I would have had to start over after that freeze, but um, they are in and um, doing pretty well. Um, I always experiment with new heirloom varieties, and those can always be a little tricky. So, yeah. but when they produce well, it's super rewarding. Yes. Yes, I agree. I agree. <laughs> I've kind of liked the beefsteak, but I tell you, if a bird pecks it or something, with they're they're difficult to pull off in Houston, just because to get them up to harvest state, you know, that's a lot of risk because that's a big tomato. <laughs> Yes, for sure. It's like if one thing goes wrong and you lose like half your crop. <laughs> I, I love to, to put them in the uh, freezer for, uh, you know, uh, do them sauce. And uh, I, uh, I grow a lot of the medium size or a lot of the paste for that reason. Yeah, I love the paste. I mean, they're so versatile. They really are. They really are. I've got a couple different new varieties, well, for me in the garden right now. So I'm hoping yeah. <laughs> they do well. Yeah, I missed my salsa and my uh, spaghetti sauce last year just because my soil just wasn't agreeable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I don't know, sometimes I say it's easy to grow tomatoes, in, except that we live where we live. We live in the Houston area. <laughs> so many challenges, but uh, right. It's it is uh, it's my favorite thing to grow for sure. Yeah. So mine, I'm doing a Roma variety, and I am doing um, cherry tomatoes. Right. I always put those in too, so I have snacks when I'm in the garden. <laughs> <laughs> Well, cherry tomatoes is like you can't lose. You'll get some. You'll at least get a tomato. Exactly, they're prolific, and um, you know it's it's also a good way. Of course, birds are so indiscriminate. They, but I always try to do that that plant that I offer uh -huh. for the birds to have some, and that cherries are good for that. Yeah, but they don't always stay there for sure. <laughs> <laughs> they don't. And there's one variety, I think it's called Matt's Wild. Yes. Mm -hmm. And those are some wild tomatoes. I had tomatoes everywhere. Yeah, that's truly probably the closest to what the original wild growing native tomato was. Okay. Not the color, because uh, they were tended to be uh, the, more of a yellow, but, um, but that size, I call them like the BB tomatoes. <laughs> they're definitely bb tomatoes and yeah. that is a sprawler that that guy likes to just go everywhere <laughs> i want to say welcome everyone to our series with aarp and urban harvest um we are going to be talking about tomatoes so one of the most popular crops and we have the expert here to answer all of our wonderful tomato questions, Ms. Sherry Cruz. Um, I want to give a special shout out to Ms. Uh, Chandra Waggle, who's the Associate State Director of Outreach and Advocacy for AARP here in Houston. So thank getting your spring tomatoes in the ground and taken care of and uh, teach you a few little tricks to help you learn everything you possibly can to give you the most success. Righty, um, again, we're with Urban Harvest and Urban Harvest is a nonprofit operating here in the greater Houston area. And we wear many hats. We do facilitate a farmer's market uh, with wonderful produce and floral products available um, each and every Saturday. We have um, many, over a hundred community gardens that we um, sponsor and, and support uh, with education, with 
plant sharing. And we're also in the education uh, with adult classes such as this, as well as we're partnered with many of our schools in the area. And we go in and teach the science around gardening um, with the kids. Okay, so I always like to start with a little history. So um, tomatoes are native to Western South America. Uh, if you think of the Andes and current day Peru, that is where we believe the first wild tomatoes existed, but they were cultivated uh, by the Aztecs um, in Mexico. And they're the ones that first started um, cultivating and farming tomatoes. Uh, we did see the tomatoes then travel to Europe uh, with some of the early explorers in the 1500s. And then it did start to spread across Europe, taking off, uh, of course, in Southern Europe because they grew better there uh, and weren't as popular in the North. And then we started to see them uh, being grown by our Southern colonists back full circle into the Americas by the 1680s. Today, the world production is over 160 million tons, and they're not sure, but we're seeing upwards of 100, excuse me, 35,000 different tomato varieties. Tomatoes are the most popular garden crop um, across the world, and so um, to growers are always producing new varieties to keep up with that demand. So they are packed with antioxidants, they're high in vitamins, they're loaded with lots of minerals, they do have some fiber, and of course they're filled with water, which is always good to hydrate our body. Okay, let's get started on the planting. I always want to remind you here at Urban Harvest, we do teach organic methods. So as I'm speaking with you today, it will all be organic methods. Uh, we of course encourage that. Um, I think about organics more of feeding the soil, keeping the soil healthy, because if you have healthy soil, you will then have healthy producing plants. Many people of course still use the conventional chemical fertilizers but you're really burning up all the life in that soil. Um, the um, chemical fertilizers have a lot of salts in them, a lot of harsh, harsh chemicals. And over time, you're really just killing off your healthy soil web and all the little thousands and thousands of little microorganisms that support that soil web. So to start your planting, are you gonna plant in a raised bed? Uh, here in the Texas Gulf Coast, our soil is a heavy clay soil and is not conducive to good healthy tomatoes. So we do need at least eight inches um, of a raised container. Um, and then you could choose a container. So your large varieties, the indeterminate tomatoes, I would recommend starting off with at least a 10 gallon container if you're growing a patio or a determinate variety. Those tomatoes normally get only about four feet. And so you're um, good with at least a five gallon container. They grow very well in containers. And then your soil is the most important aspect that you can control. You cannot control the weather. So um, starting off with a good loamy, sandy soil mix uh, that drains well is going to be your best bet. Um, and then you need to plan ahead for amendments. Tomatoes are heavy feeders. So you wanna use, uh, select a nice organic uh, fertilizer. I always keep a good organic granular fertilizer that I will use at planting time, as well as a liquid fertilizer because I do believe in a lot of foliar feeding. So actually feeding the leaves of the plant by mixing up a nice foliar feed along the way then you're going to have to provide some sort of support for certainly your indeterminate, your large variety tomatoes. Um, they're truly vining in nature. So, um, and if you're lucky and they're heavy with fruit, you're gonna to wanna to be able to um, 
keep that plant raised off the ground for air circulation and keep that fruit off the ground. So it could be a cage. They, they have many varieties um, available on the market. Just make sure you get a really large cage. I see many people buying those smaller cages, which are truly more of a, a pepper cage than a tomato cage. Um, I've seen, I think the record tomato plant um, is about, reached about 65 feet in height. Uh, I've certainly seen them reach 20 easily. So um, you're gonna need a large cage or you can stake them. Our commercial growers don't use cages. That's, that's an expense. So a lot of it's about the amount of money that you wish to spend or have to spend on it. Um, they'll run um, stakes along the ground uh, and uh, support wires down their row and, and tie them up um, and keep them off the ground in that manner. Um, and then you need to think about mulch. Uh, certainly here in the Texas Gulf Coast, mulch is very, um, important. It helps keep the soil cooler around that and keeps those roots cooler. It's going to help keep moisture in the soil. It also helps with a splashback of soil-borne soil pathogens. Every time you're watering, um, you're hitting um, that soil and you can get some pathogens splashing up from the soil. So that will help mitigate that as well. And it can help reduce weed uh, seeds germinating. So I like this, and this was from George Washington Carver. Many people know him uh, with his work from sweet potatoes and certainly peanuts, but he also really loved tomatoes. In fact, he wrote um, about a 150 page agricultural paper all about tomatoes. And this is his recipe uh, for compost. So you need to take two loads of leaves from the forest and muck from the swamp were spread over a bottom of a pen, then one load of barnyard manure. And this was continued until the pen was full and rounded over at the top like a potato hill. So as to prevent the excess of water from washing off the fertilizing constituents. To this heap, old rags, plaster, lime, paper, wood ashes, and finely beaten up bones, etc., can be advantageously added, making this compost heap in the fall so it will be well rotted by spring. So I just love this. I don't know where I would get swamp muck, but um, just shows you um, the importance of adding good organic matter back to your soil. Then your soil pH, um, the soil pH affects the availability of the nutrients in your soil. Plants do need about 17 elements for a successful um, plant. So the top three, um, the macronutrients, so these are the uh, nutrients that you see listed anytime you're buying fertilizer in any form are going to be nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And this chart here is just showing you the availability of these nutrients to the plant given the pH of the soil. Tomatoes do like it slightly acidic. So, um, and you can see the availability of your nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Um, so <clears throat> these nutrients need to be dissolved and brought up with the water. Um, and the, if your pH is off, this can affect the ability of them to uh, bring up these nutrients. A simple soil test, they sell these tests at some of the better um, garden stores. If you're having consistent issues with your soil, you can always um, take a soil sample. Uh, you can get a form on uh, Texas A&M's website and you can send it in to them. It's not that expensive. And they'll send you back a very full report um, letting you know what's going on with your soil, the problems with your soil, and recommendations to fix your problem. So now you're gonna decide what you're going to plant. Are you gonna start with a seed? Just remembering that tomatoes 
uh, need to get in before and get producing before we get extreme heats or they won't set their fruit. So at this time in the greater Houston area, you're gonna to need to use a transplant. Um, when we start from seed, you need to plant at least six to eight weeks uh, for that plant to, to grow up before you're gonna place it in your garden. And then are you gonna grow a determinate or indeterminate variety? Now, I will let you know that probably most tomatoes uh, the, or the larger, larger majority of them are indeterminate, meaning that they will grow and continue to grow and continue to produce throughout until they are either dead from disease or there's a freeze that brings them down. A determinate is um, going to be a small variety reaching only about four feet. They tend to put all the fruit on at one time and then they're done. So the determinants, of course, work well in small containers on your patio if you don't have a, a, a large space. And the indeterminate will need a bit more space and uh, certainly support. And then uh, you want to determine maybe your days to maturity. Uh, how long is your growing season? Um, do you have long enough uh, to grow the large beefsteak varieties that get quite large? Or are you going to stick with um, uh, a plant that's going to mature much more quickly, say a, maybe a cherry or a grape variety? And then are you going to choose a hybrid or an heirloom variety? So and heirloom tomatoes are strains that have been reproduced for generations and they are open pollinated. These are varieties that either had high value because of their flavor, because they were heavy producers um, and people saved these seeds and passed them off with, you know, to friends um, and kept these varieties alive. And then hybrid tomatoes um, are, are purposely crossed between two different varieties. And these are selections you're, you're most often gonna find in the grocery store. And they're usually bred for um, storage, for a firm outside skin so that they, perfect shape, so they ship well and hold well on the shelf. Uh, the thicker skin not allowing for the escape of the water. So this tomato still looks good on the shelf. Um, and so they often then, don't they kind of forget to breed in flavor so heirlooms can be a little trickier to grow because they do not have the breeding for resistance to um, many of disease uh, pressures that we experience certainly here in the Gulf Coast um, Houston area. So many choices and this refers to the size of the tomato, uh, a currant or a cherry, a grape, little pear-shaped tomatoes, there's salad-sized uh, tomatoes, there's paste tomatoes, uh, tomatoes that have a thicker wall so that there's a lot more meat um, as you cook these tomatoes down. And then of course your slicers, your big tomatoes, you're gonna wanna slice up fresh for those great sandwiches and burgers. So um, you're gonna wanna plant appropriate varieties. So thinking about your space, um, how, how much space you have. You want to think about your timing. Um, it, do I have time to grow the big beefsteak tomato before the weather turns uh, unfavorable? Um, and then you want to choose the right place. Our tomatoes are going to need full sun. Plants get stressed uh, if they're not getting this, the sun, the adequate sun that they need. And uh, they need at least six hours but eight is good. Um, your cherry tomatoes can take a little less sun than the larger varieties. You're gonna to wanna to plant strong seedlings. Don't be afraid to um, take the plant out of this little container. Um, when you're shopping and purchasing, make sure you see healthy white roots. Uh, make sure you don't see yellowing on the plant that could be indicative that it's, it's um, already has some disease present. And then of course, plant at the right time. Tomatoes here, uh, we have to get them in the ground, get them producing and setting fruit. Once it gets above 85 degrees, 24 seven, a uh, tomato will not set fruit. The blossoms, you'll have the blossom drop. Um, 
The reason being tomatoes are self-pollinating. And certainly here and on the Gulf Coast area, we have hot, sticky, humid weather and the pollen doesn't drop very well from flower to flower in our sticky, um, humid weather. So you want to prepare your soil. If you, you know, you're doing all this and you've got the time going uh, correctly, about two weeks out, go out and prepare your soil. Um, I have large raised beds personally, uh, but even in a container, you want to maybe come back and add a couple inches of a good healthy compost. So adding some nutrients back to the soil. Uh, go ahead, maybe add some uh, granular um, organic fertilizer and work that into your soil. And then uh, it's going to be um, <clears throat> time to go ahead and plant. So when you plant a tomato transplant, you will uh, prepare your hole. You're gonna dig your hole um, deeper than your container. Tomatoes are a little bit unique in the way that you can plant them because normally with a plant, you're not gonna plant it any deeper than it currently sits in its container that you've purchased. But a tomato, you can plant quite deeply. I often plant about 60% of the stem of that plant. If you look closely at a little tomato plant, you're gonna see these little fine hairs up and down the um, stem of that plant. Those are all potential roots. So anywhere that that stem is touching the soil or under the soil, new, ro new, ro new roots will form. So the bigger, the larger the root, the better able that plant is, you know, stability, standing up, holding, supporting all the, the fruit and also the deeper, larger root system can reach down into a soil and it's gonna be a little more drought tolerant. So it's gonna have, have more access to water and to nutrients in that soil. So you're gonna dig your hole and if you um, plant your tomato, like I said, go ahead and go fairly deeply. I personally pinch off the leaves that would be underground. Some people don't, they just go ahead and bury it. Um, and, uh, but you're going to dig your hole. You're going to add a scoop of fertilizer, mix that well into the soil. Okay. So just incorporate it into the surrounding soil. And then you're going to come with a little rock phosphate, which you can find at your better garden stores. Um, it's just going to look like, um, some powdered rock and you add a teeniest little pinch of that. That's going to help stimulate root growth. The uh, old timers used to throw uh, matches down. They'd dig their hole and get it prepared and they would throw matches uh, down because matches are, um, have phosphorus. And then you're going to plant your plant, backfill, secure your plant down in there and then you're gonna water it deeply. You have stressed that plant, you've disturbed the roots and you know it's gonna be a little bit stressed so you wanna water it deeply and give it that good first drink of water. And now it's time to uh, either put your cage down over top if you're using a cage, or if you're staking, go ahead and put that stake down in the ground now. Even though it's a tiny little baby, you wanna put that in now because you're less likely to disturb roots. Uh, once that plant's got big roots and, it's, and you think, oh, I need to hurry and stake it. Well, now you may, might be damaging roots by sticking that stake in the ground. Now we're a little past that now here towards the end of March, but we in the um, Houston area put our tomatoes in very early. And so then there's a need to wrap them and you can use a frost cloth or some plastic material um, as, and wrap that cage. And that's gonna protect that tomato. If we're still seeing um, temperatures that maybe get down into the 30s. That's very damaging to tomatoes. But also March and April can be very, very windy. And so that wind uh, can be damaging to the small little baby plants. So we do wrap them. And that's when it's nice to have that cage for support uh, of that material that you're wrapping. So the ideal temperatures for transplants is going to be uh, when your weather is between 70 and 75. 
you start to see um, the pollination. Once you start to have your flowers on the plant, you start to see pollination at night when the temperatures are between 55 and 70. And as I mentioned earlier, day pollination, we need temperatures less than 85 because once it's above that, it's a little hard that pollen doesn't drop from flower to flower very easily. I find it very helpful to go out and shake my cage, shake the stake, vibrate that plant. That's going to help maybe release some of that pollen. Or you could um, just take a paintbrush and go around and tickle each flower. And I really do find that helpful when uh, it starts to get uh, close to that 85 and above temperature um, and get better pollination. Like I say, if a flower is not pollinated, it will simply drop right off the plant. You could have all these beautiful flowers um, and they could start to drop when not properly pollinated. So as you're continuing to uh, cultivate your plant in your garden, you're gonna water it at least one to three inches um, a week, of course, depending on the temperature and um, the amount of sun you're getting. It's been a lot of cloudy days, maybe a, lot, a little less water. But the real key is consistent watering. Tomatoes do well with a little stress, but they really just want that, that consistent watering. So whatever water schedule you get on, just try to be consistent with the amount of water that your plants do get. And then after your fruit is set, you can go ahead and fertilize, whether that's side dressing, digging a little hole to the side of your plant and uh, putting out some granular fertilizer, working it into the soil or foliar feeding. And that's um, the method that I choose to use quite often uh, in our severe heat here in the Houston area. And I do have a lot of plants, uh, a lot of tomatoes that I do grow in containers as well. Um, and as you're watering and watering, and it, sometimes it does take daily watering in a container because they dry out much more quickly than if they're in a garden bed. Uh, you're leaching out a lot of those nutrients. And so I find that uh, the follicular feeding is a real good way to quickly supply your plants with nutrients and really keep them going through this, the extreme heat that we do experience here in South Texas. So pruning, this is kind of a subject you'll hear all different methods. Um, some people absolutely do not prune. Some people swear by pruning. Some people prune very severely. Um, so pruning can, can help keep your plants obviously compact, make them a little easier to stake. Uh, you certainly need airflow. Uh, because tomatoes are highly prone to fungal pressures. And so um, if uh, you've got a lot of good airflow, you're going to let your leaves, when they do get wet, um, they're going to evaporate better. Um, and then uh, uh, certainly lowering, um, taking off stems and leaf from the lower part of the plant is going to help mitigate some of the soil, soil borne disease pressures that we have. Um, Fungal diseases are spread by spores. And so every time you splash some fungus, it's going to just shatter and fungus will just uh, be in the air and splash and, you know, hit your leaves and spread. So, but the downside of pruning is you're, um, if you prune too severely um, and your plant is receiving that good eight hours, you could get some sun scalding on the fruit. And then certainly your fruit is more visible to uh, birds or other pests, insect pests. And then of course there's less leaves uh, to make the food for the plant through photosynthesis. And then also you are wounding the plant when you snip um, and prune on that plant. So what I like to do, I certainly do remove all the lower uh, branches. I like to bring up as my plants grow and mature, I like to have my leaves off at least about 10 inches up off the soil. And I do start to take off some of the sucker stems. The sucker stems are the, the stems uh, that start to grow in the little V areas off of the main branches coming off the main stem. So I do um, I pinch about half of those off. 
just try to do a, a, a happy medium. And of course, the clo closer you are growing your plants, I plant mine, I start planting them um, uh, about four feet apart. And as they grow, they're certainly gonna grow into all that space. And then I might need to do a little more pruning uh, to again, allow a little more airflow. So feeding tomatoes, uh, of course, their macronutrients we touched on earlier um, are the nitrogen. Nitrogen encourages the green growth, uh, the new growth of the plant. But you be careful about adding too much nitrogen because if you have too much nitrogen, it's going to have excessive uh, leaf growth and it's going to discourage blossom and fruit. Phosphorus, uh, that middle number that you find um, on a fertilizer is going to encourage your flowering and therefore your fruiting. And then the third number being potassium and it's going to um, really help support the root formation and help uh, the plant uh, better bring up the nutrients and the water through its root system. So when is it time to harvest? So a tomato will continue, of course, to ripen until, until it's, its eventual color when you leave it on the vine. And that's always the instinct is to let that, that uh, tomato vine ripen. But there's a lot of risk with that. Um, the more color that tomato is um, showing, then the more attractive it becomes to our birds and some of the other insect pests that attack our tomatoes. So you can harvest a tomato when they start to blush out. So when they, about 20 to 30% of that tomato is showing that end color, you may go ahead and remove it and bring it inside and put it in a nice, um, warm but not direct sun location and that tomato will ripen to its full flavor just never put a tomato into the refrigerator now other than when once you've sliced it you'd never put a tomato because it immediately kills the flavor and will discontinue the ripening process when you get tomatoes at the store and they don't have flavor They've picked those tomatoes when they're green because they need to get them to the store to you before they start to rot. And they pick them really very green. So they haven't even thought about blushing out yet. And they drive them into a warehouse. They artificially gas them because fruits, most fruits emit an ethylene gas and that creates the ripening process, starts the ripening process. So they artificially gas them with uh, this gas to turn them. So basically, you're you're. It's like taking a green tomato and painting it red. Okay. So, but once you pick your tomato and bring it in, it will continue to ripen, and uh, that way you're mitigating those birds attacking. So uh, and getting your tomato before you can get to it. So. If you look at a tomato, and here I have the picture, that it looks like it's called the abscission zone, but it looks, or you can just call it the little knuckle. So it's, it's the little, it looks like a little connection that your baby tomato is hanging from. That little area has the ability to shut off and shut off the nutrients and the water flowing to that tomato as it's forming. And it starts to do that as your tomato starts to ripen. So even if you left it on to its full color, it's really not receiving anything else from the plant. So um, it's just the science of it. It's um, that reason why you can go ahead and bring it in and it will fully ripen. So now let's talk about some of the diseases. Uh, again, we have so many that um, present themselves, so many challenges um, in our weather that we experience here in the South. So you need to anticipate. So be aware of uh, the possibility of being attacked by certain pests. 
uh, or uh, that the possibility of fungal disease and be ready for it. Monitoring. I go out, I suggest, you know, if you every day, go out and check your plants, go out in the morning, look for signs of disease. It's much easier to, to um, attack and solve a problem when it first gets started, before it spreads to all your plants. And learn to identify um, the different fungal diseases and the different insect pests that attack us in the garden. So some of the ways, some of the organic methods you can use in prevention is to first rotate your crops. It is said that you should only plant tomatoes or anything in the family, the nightshade family, once every four years. So giving time for the soil uh, to clean itself of some of the soil-borne pathogens, maybe making it a little harder for the insects, pests, uh, to find your plants. In keeping your soil improved, adding uh, the appropriate amendments, keeping that soil healthy, organic amendments, uh, adding compost, a nice compost layer to add uh, natural organic um, nutrients back to your soil. Proper watering. Again, a stressed plant is going to be more susceptible to disease and insect pressures. And you're going to want to immediately destroy infected plants. Um, I personally had this happen to me last year. I started to see a little white fly infestation. Uh, I always um, hold off on treating even with organic pesticides um, and just try to let some of nature's natural predators take care. And I let it go a little too far. I tried to treat the plant and I didn't pull it out in time and it did spread to some of my other plants. So um, tomato plants always go in the trash. Never try to um, compost a tomato plant because of the disease issues that we have with tomatoes. You do wanna destroy those plants. And Certainly if that tomato is in the shade and not getting the appropriate amount of sun, again, it is stressed and more prone to disease and pest issues. Then if the worst case scenario and your soil is really in a bad situation, maybe you have nematodes, um, there's maybe a lot of fungal diseases, uh, every year you have the same issue, you, you, you get um, early blight, you get a fungal disease every year, might be time to, um, I call it the nuclear um, <laughs> event to solar, solar, solarize your soil because you're going to have to cover that soil with, cover your bed with plastic and let it bake and heat up in the sun, basically killing everything in that soil. The good guys along with the bad guys and just bake that soil to death. And then you will need to come back and totally add amendments, lots of fertilizers, maybe even a, a scoop of soil from other, where, other uh, place in your yard to add, start adding back microbes. Uh, and the good fungus, because there is certainly good fungus in your soil. So you're going to have to rebuild that soil from the ground up. So some of the diseases and uh, when you are buying transplants, when I talked about the hybrids, you'll see these letters uh, on the culture tag. So the little tag that gives you the information about what variety that plant is, gives you the information about these uh, sun and the, the water needs of that plant, you might see um, these little letters and these indicate what resistance has been bred into that particular plant. And like I said, you will see not see these on heirlooms, but you will see these on the hybrid plants. So these are the different, uh, the different breeding to breed in this resistance. So we have, we start with the uh, vertriculum, vertriculum wilt, uh, fungal disease, and fusarium wilt, another fungal disease. Nematodes are little microscopic critters living in the soil. They attack your roots. 
uh, and uh, they infest the roots, and then your plant is not able to bring up sufficient water and nutrients. Um, if you um, have that issue, there's good nematodes and bad nematodes, so you need to be aware of that. Um, and then the rest are also fungal diseases that present in different ways. So when you apply fungicides, uh, you're going to maybe start uh, proactively if you know that you have a history of uh, fungal diseases um, in your space. So um, <clears throat> you want to treat then perhaps before symptoms begin by buying a good organic fungicide. A lot of the organic fungicides will be based with, a, a, have copper as in their um, uh, formula. And then you would start to spray the soil maybe before you put in your transplant and then start to spray your transplant. You're gonna to want to spray the entire plant, the upper and lower surfaces of the leaves and of course the flowers. And you're gonna to want to have a thorough coverage Okay, uh, and you're going to spray it to the point of dripping. And then if you get rain, you're going to want to reapply it and then spray about seven to every seven to 14 days. Okay, so uh, one of the most common that we um, unfortunately see in Houston is early blight um, and just prevention. So maybe proactively spraying. Um, the um, fungicide and of course using it organic fungicide even though organic please be judicious with that uh, we have started to see that even organic fungicide affects some of our bee populations because certain funguses are important to the bees um, the honeybees actually make something called a bee bread which requires a, a fungus and so uh, we're starting to worry um, that some of these even organic fungicides are affecting our our honeybee population eucerium wilt is going to attack and you might see where you're, you've just watered and then you go out a couple hours later and your plant still looks all wilted. Um, it's going to, it's a really wicked uh, fungus and it's going to totally destroy the entire plant. You could cut a stem and you start to see what looks little, really black inside and you're just going to have to pull that, that plant out and destroy that plant, dispose of it completely. So bacterial wilt, again, you'll start to see a lot of um, wilting of the plant. Uh, things you can do certainly, of course, are rotate, keep that, that proper crop rotation, plant resistant varieties, uh, make sure that your pH balance is good so your soil's getting the nutrients it needs. Um, again, that airflow is really critical to keeping healthy tomato plants, so plant them. Um, as far apart as your space will allow. And then of course, the only thing you can do here too then is going to uh, remove and destroy that plant. And nematodes, uh, again, those little microscopic guys living in the soil. Uh, some, these are the root crop nematodes that uh, attach to the roots. You're just gonna have to pull that plant up. And when you pull it up, you're gonna see your, the roots of your plant look all little, like little, little knots all um, up and down those roots. Uh, there are um, uh, predator types of nematodes that are good guys in the soil. So you're gonna uh, just have to, to know um, that when you start to see wilting and you start to look at that, uh, the roots on that plant and they're knotted, you've got, and they tend to, to stay in your soil. So this is when I mentioned that uh, might be a case for solarizing that soil. If you think you have a heavy, um, infestation of the root knot nematodes. Now we'll look at pests. So though tomato hornworm um, can, um, it's a moth and uh, the mother will lay her eggs um, on your plants and the um, uh, caterpillar uh, will um, feast on your tomatoes and you will see they get quite big. They can get as big as your finger. Um, they are perfectly shaded 
to match the uh, leaves and the stems so they can be a little hard to find. But if you go out and you see a tomato half eaten or you start to see a lot of leaves missing and eaten, and then if you start to see the frass, which is caterpillar poop, so you see what looks like little black balls all uh, laying on some of the leaves, you need to start looking for the tomato hornworm. Okay, and um, you have to really pull leaves apart, pull stems apart. He's gonna be in there, he's hard to find. Or you can go out at night with a black light and they actually glow at night. But if you're not doing that, go out in the morning. They tend to be more up on the upper parts of the plant in the morning and uh, search them out. Then you just remove them from the plant and they're called hornworm because they have this little uh, attachment at the back that looks like a little horn but um, it's actually very soft. It's just, it's defense mechanism trying to look scary to birds. Um, but you just need to pluck them off and dispose of them. Um, I don't like to smush things. So I just bring out a bucket of water uh, for all pests and I'll just throw them in there and drown them. But it's, it is a, a large moth and um, she will lay her eggs um, and then um, the, Caterpillar will devastate a plant quite quickly. And uh, then the caterpillar, once it's through eating, will go down to the ground to pupate and it will overwinter in the ground. So one way to sort of mitigate um, this is prior to planting tomatoes, perhaps you do a bit of tilling and maybe then you can find the pupa and destroy them. And they're actually quite large and you actually can see that little horn structure um, on the pupa as well. So it'll be pretty clear what that is. I don't worry too much about hornworms because it's pretty clear when you get them. Um, and then you just, it's just a matter of finding them and getting rid of them. Um, and you never, it never seem to have too many. Usually there's going to be one or two. Um, and I pull them off and then we're done with them. Okay. And then um, start to learn what some of the different eggs look like. So here is some hornworm eggs. You might, uh, I talked about monitoring and I always go out and I, uh, you know, when our tomato plants get quite large, I mean, this could be quite the task, but I do always do a quick little look and look to see if I see eggs um, of any known pests, because certainly this is the best time um, to remove that pest from your plant is removing those eggs. So the largest, problem I have, and I think many uh, Gulf Coast gardeners have, are stink bugs or the leaf-footed bugs. These insects have sucking mouth parts. They are particularly attracted to plants in the nightshade family, uh, which would include your chilies and your eggplants, uh, but they seem to stick with tomatoes in my garden. And so, they have that sucking mouth part. So not only will they suck all the juices out of your plants, uh, whether it's the leaves or the fruit themselves, but anywhere that they stick their little mouth part in, they could be introducing diseases, bacterial diseases and things um, that they bring with them from other plants. Um, you'll start to see um, little brown spots on your tomatoes and that tomato would never really ripen well after that. Um, there's um, just um, they can, and when there's one, there's hundreds of them. They, they lay lots of eggs. Uh, again, you need to start looking for them in when they're in their immature stage. Um, and um, they look, they're, the uh, leaf-footed bugs are going to be, the immatures uh, are gonna be an orangey brown color. They have long little skinny black legs. Not to be confused, if you see um, in the upper portion of the screen, you're going to see the assassin nymph, and they look really similar, but the leaf-footed bug is going to have a fatter back legs uh, that you can see, but I think the biggest clue is assassin bugs are predators, so they don't hang out together, but if you see these little orange 
characters and there's 50, 60, 70 of them, they're gonna be all clustered together. And you can often find them on the underside of a leaf. And I just remove that whole leaf and throw them down in my bucket of water, which I put a little bit of dish soap in. And that forms that surfactant across the top to help keep them down under the water. Um, and then familiarize yourself with their eggs. They're actually pretty eggs, but they grow in a long chain. So check for the eggs and, and, and rid yourself of those eggs. And then aphids. I don't find aphids to be a particularly bad problem on tomatoes, but again, where there's one, there's thousands of them. Um, they do um, seem to hover on the underside of a leaf and you probably wouldn't see just one if it were by itself, but because they do tend to all hang out by the thousands, you'll see them all clustered. And aphids can be yellow, they can be brown, they can be red. Um, so one clue for aphids is you might, might um, start to see this little shiny, sticky looking substance. Well, that is called honeydew. And that is a result, um, the aphid also has a sucking mouth part. And as it sucks from the xylem um, tube of your plants, it's going to be uh, taking in lots of sugars that that plant's been producing. And it, its body can't digest all those sugars. So it, is, it excretes uh, the honeydew. And uh, that's attractive because it's all sugary to ants. And so you'll start to see ants populate and actually protect the aphids because they harvest the honeydew. But if you start to see the, the um, shiny sticky substance, start turning out those leaves and, and checking for aphids. Aphids are soft bodied and it's pretty easy to take care of them by just taking off a hose with a strong stream of water and flushing those aphids off and down to the ground and they don't repopulate. Right, tomato fruit worms, you have another moth, is going to be laying eggs and they will they love to embed and eat from your fruit again just start watching for damage um, and just removing um, any green fruit that you suspect um, you have the caterpillars in now blossom in rot um, is more of a uh, cultural it's not a disease issue it's a cultural issue and it comes from the lack of calcium to the plant. This does not necessarily mean you have a lack of calcium in your soil. It just means that calcium is not being brought up from the soil. And that could be the pH issue that we discussed earlier. Um, it also, but inconsistent watering, because remember, nutrients need to be dissolved in water to be available to your plant. So your calcium will not be available if um, it, the plant does not have sufficient water. Um, it could be a result of damaged roots, again, affecting the uptake of nutrients in water. If, you, if it's still really cold, again, that's going to affect that uptake. Excessive heat. Um, then too much nitrogen is going to, again, uh, uh, keep you from the, uh, the proper calcium uptake. Um, too much salts, and this can be from um, too much of the conventional uh, fertilizers. Sherry? Yes. Hi. <laughs> Hi. We have about uh, four minutes left. Oh, okay. Well, let me just 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 run real quick through the slides. So blossom drop is lack of pollination. Again, thumping helpings really fast. Hardcore can be your just your variety, uh, which is what what I often find, uh, or too much fertilizer. And then of course uh, we often have uh, birds and insects that uh, get to our tomatoes. And okay, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Very good, perfect timing. <laughs> so um, I just want to remind everybody who joined kind of late, if they wouldn't mind taking the survey, we would be grateful. And when you end, uh, when you go to log off, the survey will pop up um, from Urban Harvest. 
Also, we put some helpful uh, links on the slide there for you to see. I just want to mention we have a specialty herb gardening Zoom class on Wednesday. Um, it'll be taught by Jeannie Dunahu, who's a master gardener. She's a member of the Herb Society and she's been doing it for like 25 years. So she is also a wealth of information. Um, and all those links are there on the right hand side. So let's get to a few questions. I tried to answer a few, Sherry, but you are definitely the professional. <laughs> so Linda asks, what's the best barnyard manure to use? I've been using horse manure, but is there a better source? Well, it, it, you uh, want to think about um, the nitrogen content and chicken manure has the highest uh, nitrogen content. But with any of them, it's really more a matter of maybe what's going to be the cleanest. There's a lot of concern in the organic community about what the animal is being is being fed. And so how clean that that manure is. And the other thing would be, I mean, horse manure is fantastic, is that it needs to be well composted. You don't want to add it when it's too hot. So when it's too fresh and it hasn't already been de decomposed enough, it can be what we could say too hot. So it actually will burn. Um, the, it has the potential to burn our plants with, um, but horse, horse is fine. Okay. Just make sure it's well composted. Okay, so the next question is um, it's from someone. They said, I'm growing a tomato named uh, Moskovisk. I think I'm pronouncing that right. It's referred to as a semi-determinant. What does semi-determinant mean? Okay, good question. Semi-determinant means that it's going to grow to a determined height. So it's still gonna be a small plant and it's still gonna put all its fruit on at the one time, but it might necessarily not have smaller uh, branches. It might have big leaves and long, long branches, but it's still gonna to grow to maybe four um, feet. So gonna stay compact height wise, but not necessarily width wise. Okay, nice, nice. Um, so the next question is from Stella Pitt. It says, good to know about wrapping. I'm in Como County, Texas, and we had a hailstorm. Of course, I had just put out my tomato. <laughs> <laughs> oh, feel for you. <laughs> uh, some have broken tops, and I want to know if they will be okay if there's no tops but still some leaves. Um, it's, it's gonna impact overall production. Um, I would say just feed them well. Um, uh, my concern, of course, a hailstorm doesn't necessarily mean that you had prolonged cold, uh, cause hailstorms can come at any time, I suppose. Uh, they are susceptible to, you know, wind and, and, and cold weather. And it, it does affect overall production. Um, but if your plants are showing, you know, good healthy leaves and stems, it's doing its thing to recover and you should be able to get some tomatoes out of it. I just think that it, it, you might have reduced production. Okay. Okay. Um, I have a couple more questions and we're almost out of, we're pretty much right at time. Sherry, do you want to should I read them or? Yes, I mean I'm 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 fine. I don't I don't ask guys. I'll try to go fast. How you guys are with time? <laughs> so someone says, "How do you deal with white fly?" Oh, uh, white flies. You uh, <laughs> you do need to find a a good um, organic pesticide, uh, and you need to to catch that really early. Uh, you need to to apply. Uh, every, at least every 14 days, uh, this organic pesticide, I actually, um, you can use safer soap. So, um, it's, it's gonna, uh, smother the, the little, um, pest, but, um, I have, I had gone to a do-it-yourself pest store and purchased an organic, uh, 
pesticide and it's got things like cinnamon oil in it. And so um, it, it was more effective than using the safer soap product. But the key is to, to starting right away. If it's a small, small little population, just remove those leaves, bag them, get them in the trash. If you can contain them mechanically by that means, just plucking them, you know, getting rid of, of that area of infestation. But then again, if it's if you've got a little more spread, you need to spray every 14 days with an organic pesticide and you need to um, really coat that plant, making sure you uh, coat the underside of the leaves as well. Okay, so that kind of leads into the next question, which someone says, do you recommend neem oil? So uh, neem is good, but you have to be really careful if it gets too hot. Uh, neem is, can be used in certain, you know, when the temperatures get, you know, up in the high 80s, up into 90s. Uh, but always spray, it's best to always go out in the early morning because you're going to go in uh, before maybe some of our pollinators are, are out. So as early as you can, you know, get out there and spray in the morning um, and um, just, just again, early detection is key for all these things. Okay, so um, Bev's question is, we have an atrium that is open, but has a, a material shade cover on the top. Would that be a good, em would that be a good environment for container tomatoes? It does get full sun, but the shade cover prevents a lot of the heat. Well, there, it, there are some people that recommend a, a, a light shade cloth and just, I don't know what degree of shade cloth you have because there's different degrees. Um, but um, if it's getting full sun, so if it's getting at least six hours of sun, I don't see why that wouldn't be a great place for it. Um, again, tomatoes are self-pollinating, so they do require wind uh, to, help that pollen drop from flower to flower. Um, I would recommend that you do do like I said about shaking your plant, you know, helping to be that pollinator for that plant. Because if you're in an enclosed atrium, I don't know how much wind you would actually have in there. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and the very last question is, my tomato plants seem to grow tall and leggy and not very bushy. Can I prune them in a way to be more bushy and not so leggy? Well, I, I would question how much sun you're getting. Uh, sometimes they, they grow real leggy when they're, they're not getting full sun. Uh, I would, would wonder um, if they're getting the proper nutrition um, and pruning them. Um, I've never used pruning. You would use pruning for that reason on a lot of perennials. Uh, I've never used it for that reason for tomatoes. Um, I, I don't know on that. I would say, um, you know, gardening is all experimental. I would go ahead and, and, uh, if it's an indeterminate variety, I wouldn't prune, uh, a determinate, a patio sized tomato in that method, but you could definitely try that with the indeterminate tomato. But um, I've, I've personally never used that for um, that issue. I would tend to think more of it as a sun issue. It's, it's growing super tall, reaching, trying to find some sun. Right, right. So with that being said, I want to say thank you so much, Sherry. You knocked it out of the ballpark again. Special thanks to AARP and all of our participants. And we look forward to providing more classes for you in the future. Enjoy the rest of your day.